Greetings, innovators and tech enthusiasts, and welcome to the Women Who Code podcast. My name is Megan Pope, and I'm thrilled to be hosting today's episode. A little about me, I am the Director of Quality Assurance Engineering and have a decade of experience in the industry honing my craft, ranging from hands-on, manual, and automated testing to my current role in leadership. Today, I have the absolute pleasure of sitting down with Laura Belmain, founder and CEO of SafeStack, to learn about how we can build an amazing technology-based future securely. An experienced conference and keynote speaker, trainer, and regular panel member, Laura has spoken at a range of events such as Black Hat USA, Velocity, OzCon, KiwiCon, LinuxConf AU, and Microsoft Tech Ed on the subjects of privacy, covert communications, Agile, security, and security mindset. Laura, Erica, and the entire SafeStack team are looking to lift the education of developers around the world through info security training and also helping organizations become more security minded. They founded a women led company in the area of IT information security that is heavily male dominated. Their team is diverse and both mentor women across Atiora. New Zealand and support them in finding their way in info security in New Zealand, the sector where they are prominent figures due to their community engagement. Welcome, Laura, and thank you for your time and joining us. I am super excited to dive into our conversation today. Yeah, it's great to meet you, Megan, and great to be here. I'm excited to chat. Likewise. All right, Laura, the audience and myself would love to better get to know you. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey in the tech industry, what your early career looks like, and how that built the foundation of where you are today? Absolutely. Um, I'd love to say we all have this golden plan, right, that we all go to the right college and we know from age 10 that we're going to be a thing. And But that never happens, and it certainly didn't happen for me. Um, I thought I was going to be a lawyer, um, and then for a brief while I thought I was going to be Scully from the X-Files, um, and then eventually, at age 16, some things happened in my family and I needed to get a job in a bit of a hurry. And in my hometown, really, the options were, you know, retail or, you know, manufacturing or like something like a burger place. Um, except there was one employer. Um, they were called EDS at the time. They've since been bought out by Hewlett Packard. Um, and they did an apprenticeship in software development. And I knew very little about computers. I used word processors and things. But their interview was solving puzzles. And I was like, OK, cool, we'll give this a shot. You know, it pays well. And at A16, I became a junior COBOL developer, of all things. And that was many years ago now. We don't talk about age because it makes me feel very, very old at this time in the morning. Um, but I've since then had a really interesting journey from COBOL and big taxation systems through uh, real-time radiation monitoring software in Switzerland for CERN through to counterterrorism and working for the UK government. Um, and then eventually I sort of moved into security. And I found that I had this knack when I had when I saw code that I could, I always wanted to see what happened when I used it in unusual ways. And so I would find these security bugs. And I just thought it was part of being an engineer. Um, the engineering team thought it was part of being in security and sent me off to find my new friends. Um, so yeah, and ended up in security. I've been doing that a long time too. Uh, first as a consultant, and now I teach engineers just like me all around the world how to do security um, and go really fast and build amazing software. Amazing. Thank you for sharing a little bit about your background. Um, if I may, what sparked your interest in security and data protection specifically? I think I, I was always curious about it from, you know, I, when I studied um, security wasn't a subject you, you took at college or university. It was just like we had one guest lecture in like a four year degree. Um, and it was this guy, he came and he told us about this really old school attack that was against the very early, when it was just a bookstore, Amazon. And so that was curious to me. I, I kind of remember sitting in that lecture and going, ah, oh, well, I wonder if one day there's gonna be like police of this internet thing and that we're gonna to have to, you know, figure out how to stay safe. Um, fast forward a few years and then I ended up in government and doing counterterrorism. And in that, it was very clear that there were people misusing websites and causing harm. And I, I wanted to be able to make things better and safer. Um, 
I'm not the type of person who's going to invent the digital cathedral. Like, I'm not going to be the one who tries to take people to Mars. That's just not how I'm wired. But I'm very, very passionate about making every tiny little innovation we have secure so that it lasts longer. So a kind of that's been my path from a little early realization to now kind of seeing it as an enabler to some of the most amazing technology that uh, is being developed right now. Yeah. And you touched on this a little bit, uh, working in government. What were some of your experiences specifically working in government? Well, I think there's, there's a, a lot of people misunderstand working for government, that it's all bureaucracy and, and slow paced and things. Um, in government, what you get is a group of people who are not motivated necessarily by money, but about mission, uh, about safety, about understanding the harm that can come from events. And so government work really helped me understand how security things could be much more than just theoretical. They could be really very actively used to do some terrible, terrible things in the world. And it gave me the confidence to work with a team to you know, use our skills combined. So technical folks like me and more operational folks, I work with linguists, um, to, to put them into a very practical context. So to look at security things, not just as a, an academic, oh, look, this is SQL injection, isn't that interesting? But to understand motivation and understand why people do bad things and how that can impact people from financially through to swaying political situations through to, you know, hurting individuals uh, on an emotional, physical level. Right. And um, can you tell me a little bit more about um, your relationship with teaching? I So I'm a funny hybrid. I think all of us who end up in teaching, if you look back far enough in your family, you can see where it came from. Uh, my granddad is the kind of tinkerer where if you went around to his house on a Sunday, he'd say, Laura, what do you want to build today? And he'd like, oh, I want to build whatever. Um, and he'd just appear with a box of bits from somewhere. Now, later, as an adult, I realized he'd actually been destroying furniture in my grandma's yeah, rooms upstairs <laughs> just so he could build other things. But, we, you know, <laughs> that aside. Um, so from him, I got this passion for creatively thinking, for problem solving, for building things, for tinkering. And then from my mom, my mom is, you know, we grew up quite poor. Um, you know, we would catch the bus between places. That's fine. Um, She's the type of person who you could be on a bus for 10 minutes and suddenly she's friends with 15 new people and has an invite to somebody's birthday party. And I never understood how this happened, but she's a storyteller and she's a connector. And when you mix together someone who loves experimenting and building things and playing with things and always looking at problems in different ways with somebody who likes connecting with people and telling stories, the natural pathway does lead itself to some form of teaching. And that's sort of where I've ended up just naturally. I never thought I'd end up as a teacher, but here I am. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. Thank you for sharing that anecdote. Um, okay. So um, before asking about how you founded your, your, your own company, what was your path to career success and leadership? Um, I'd say my path has been bumpy. Um, I think I was a reluctant leader at first. You know, I was a really nerdy person. Um, and I, this, I'm just a little bit unusual in that, you know, the way I communicate, the way I see the world. And I never really thought, I, I, I had no real interest in power or money. I'm not that sort of uh, motivation. Um, excuse me just one second. We are, uh, you know, in true security style, we're going to have a resilience issue here right now because there is a four-year-old princess literally pirouetting uh, to the side. <laughs> Aoife, my darling, could we not? Because you're very loud. Thank you. Okay, good. All right. So this resilience and security always have an instant response plan. Um, right, moving onwards. So um, I started getting into leadership a little bit early. So even when I was a a COBOL developer, even at 16, 17, I was starting to move towards leading a small team, but I didn't have the experience at that point. I didn't have the world uh, view to really understand what that meant. Um, it's been a transition for me to find my own leadership style. Um, I think we all, particularly as women in technology, a lot of our mentors and a lot of the images we see of leadership are quite male styles, um, the way they communicate, the way that they address conflict. And it took me a very long time to realize I didn't need to be a caricature of what I was seeing. I could just be my version of that. So I try and lead with kindness and empathy. Um, I think I love the picture in the background from you. It kind of sums up what I try and do in the world. Um, 
But also I can be quite direct because I've had that kind of government mil military sort of background. There's this kind of tension between let's just get stuff done and kind of a, a very high trust, high autonomy style. So, you know, if you, you're on my team, I've vetted your qualifications. I know that you can do the job. I'm going to trust you to do it. And I'm not a micromanager. I get out of people's way. And then, you know, a blamelessness. You know, we all make mistakes. Things don't go to plan. Um, it's not about the individual. It's about how we could have changed the process and the system to make sure we don't do it again. So I think it's those things combined, but it's still a journey. You know, I still probably got 20 so years of working life ahead. And I will probably look back at this in 10 years and go, wow, I had a lot to learn. Yeah, absolutely. And I can align with a lot of those things as well. Being a, a person that has recently moved into a leadership role from like individual contributor, it is, I'm still early on in my journey, but um, yeah, I align with a lot of those things. It's a, it's an ongoing journey for sure. Yeah. Um, so why did you decide to found your own company and how did you have the courage to make that leap? Oh, see, I, podcasts make me real, really awkward when I, I talk about this, because I really want to say that, you know, I had a dream from a young age. Uh, but what really happened is I had my first child. Uh, she's 10 now. Um, and I'd gone back to work. And I think my tolerance for having a bad job was just zero. At that point, I was tired, and I was grumpy. And what I was seeing was I was employed to do application security in a very fast moving company and security was just moving so slowly and development was moving so fast and nothing between these worlds was working together. And I was like, look, we have to do something different. And there was no appetite for it. And so with a, a grand total of $300 of savings, I uh, quit my job with a 10 month old and did probably the silliest thing I'd ever done and started a small consultancy. And I was like, right, I will prove that we can do security differently. Um, I literally wheeled my little office chair from home down the main street in Auckland, New Zealand, to the cheapest shared office space that I could find a desk in. And off I went. I started, you know, seeing if I could find software teams who wanted to do security, who were keen to experiment. Um, that then led into a successful consultancy and a couple of books, and that was cool. Um, and then in 2020, myself and my business partner, Erica, um, we've always been frustrated that we could do this really, really well. So we'd honed our craft at doing very fast paced application security, but it was only really accessible to people with deep pockets and big budgets. So we were like, okay, COVID's hit. We've got this lockdown period to, you know, have a play around with something. Wouldn't it be cool if we could build a product that allowed teams wherever they are in the world to do what we've been doing for 10 years in person. And so in the April, we started building. And in October, we got to market and we're now in 79 countries, um, about 1700 organizations. So it's been a bit of a wild ride. Oh my goodness, I would say so. That is absolutely incredible. Um, what were some of the challenges that you had to overcome in founding your own company? Uh, well, I think, you know, some of them echo what you feel when you move into leadership, I think. You know, you go from being very, very good at what you do. You know, I, I know I can teach people how to do application security and I can work with teams and I can grow culture. But as, as a CEO, my job is now to also look at the strategy, to look at the finances, to hire the right people. And so growing a company wasn't just about building the product. That's the bit that comes easily to someone who's got an idea. It was that, well, how do we even get this to the audience that need it? How do we grow this into a sustainable business? And every day, genuinely every day is a school day uh, when you're running a business like this. And every time you think you've got it nailed, you're like, yeah, I've got this. I understand this. Everything shifts again. And uh, <laughs> you go back to the beginning. Right. This is the world of technology. Yeah. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, information security and why it's important? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to clarify with, you know, we, we talk a lot right now in the world about cybersecurity, like it's this big brand new thing. Cybersecurity is actually a really old problem just with a new kind of outfit on. So humans, all of us, have always been jerks to each other. We have always been terrible people. Um, if somebody over in the other cave had something valuable that we wanted, we would go and use whatever technology of the time, whether it's rocks and sticks, to go and get that thing from someone else. Um, and it's, it's wired into our nature to, to gather things to you know, interact with other people in this way. Now, 
we've moved on from, you know, just dollars and cents and gold bars being our valuable things. And now in our organizations, our information, our data, our systems have incredible value. And so as humans, our instinct still exists. We still, you know, whether we're financially motivated or politically, whether it's vengeance, there is a need in some of us to gain these things, to harm these things, to interact with them in some way. And information security is the idea that we're protecting the information in our systems uh, from these people with these motivations. Right, and what is the role of security in innovation and development of new products? I think we've done this poorly for a long time. Historically, that role was an add-on at the end. So you'd be like, I've built this wonderful thing, it's amazing, let's put it in market. And then somebody at the side would go, hey, your baby's ugly and you should feel bad. Let's let's not sell that right now. Let's do some more work. And it was a really bad situation. You know, you've got a whole team who's really super pumped to get this thing into the world. And then, you know, the security team, you know, quite rightly are pointing out flaws in things that should have been spotted a lot, lot earlier. I think security's moved on a lot now. Um, and now we see it alongside what we call the illities in software. So those functions or those characteristics of software that we say make it good, high quality software. So that's things like uh, scaling, performance, uh, usability, accessibility. We would expect that any software we build has those criteria built into it from the start. We're increasingly now moving security into those illities. So security is not just a nice to have at the end of some software products just because you're in finance or health. Security should just be there by default. It's part of building high quality code. And I think that's an exciting time to be in this space because it stops it being a very negative thing and it starts being about doing the right thing, being an amazing engineer and going fast. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, And you had talked about uh, how, you know, things can change day after day and very, very quickly. So what is the current state of information security today and how, how has that evolved over time? I think right now we are in an early age of awareness with information security. So um, we're doing we're we're looking at it a lot more clearly across a, a broader range of organizations, which is really good. We're getting good data. You know, what how many compromises are we seeing? How many people are employed in the space? What are the things that are going wrong? What's hard? But I think most of our focus is still on can I buy a magic box to fix this problem for me? And unfortunately, security isn't really the type of thing you can fix with a magic box that you happen to buy from a trade show. And so we're in this kind of transition from, can I buy something I put in my network to solve the problem for me, to a cultural shift where we accept that the best way for us to do security is to every single person in the team to do a little bit of security every single day. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, that's hard. Changing a culture of an entire organization, an entire community takes a very long time. Yeah. And talking about where it's been, where it is, um, let's talk about where it's going. What do you see for the future? Oh, so, I I mean, everyone's got to have been playing around with generative AI by now. Like even my 10 year old has been making Harry Potter fan fiction in it. Um, But as a security person, it's like being split in two. Half of you is super excited about the future. We're going to Mars. We're you know, we've got robot doctors. Um, I was talking to a guy yesterday whose job is to make uh, legged robots navigate unknown spaces with humans in it and then just send them off with no control. It's amazing. And then the other half of me, the security person is like, this is horrifying. Oh my goodness, this is all going to go wrong. And it's a real disconnect between two sides of my brain. Um, I'm excited because I think the world needs some of these technologies, particularly in like healthcare in education, in making things more equitable in poorer regions, there's some incredible technology coming through. But the way we do security has been built looking backwards. So our security processes, our guidance is looking at how we built software for the last 20 years, not these new technologies like AI that are coming through. I think we're going to have to have a chat as a community. And I think all of us as engineers are gonna have a part in this. Uh, Well, how do we do security in these evolving systems? where we can't say for certainty on, you know, different days, are the al- is the algorithm going to behave in the same way each day? Because it's been trained on new data since the first time we made our decision. Or, you know, there's influences in it now that make our code non-linear, non-predictable. And that's amazing, but it means if we're going to understand the risk and the potential bad outcomes, we're going to have to change the way we do it. 
So lots of work ahead, but hopefully for a very good cause. Yes, yes. And uh, what would you personally like to see in an ideal tech future? What does that ideal future look like? Uh, I'm going to sound like a bit of a hippie now, that's, but forgive me. Um, for me, the ideal tech future uses technology to help uh, across entire communities. So, you know, the ones that I'm particularly excited about is in New Zealand, we don't have many specialist health practitioners. We're a tiny country of less than 5 million people. And so we don't have, genuinely just don't have enough specialist doctors for things like cancer uh, treatment and diagnosis. So there is technology being built right now that can look at mammogram scans and it can do early diagnosis based on scan using machine learning and AI. Fantastic, because it means you don't need a, a skilled person to do the first review and get people through into that system. I think the more systems we have like that that make health uh, accessible, that make uh, growing businesses and, and growing income for communities or education accessible, um, those are the things I really want to see in the world. I think it's cute that people want to go to Mars still, but I think we've <laughs> got enough problems here back home that we could apply a technology to first. I would agree with that 100%. Um, all right. Do you have any pro tips that you would like to share for women in the tech space? Yeah, I'm going to set you all a challenge. So forgive me. It's very early on my side. It's a mean thing to do in the morning. And for you, it's afternoon. Uh, but I'm going to set you the one hour challenge. So most of us work in for some form of sprint, or if we don't, we're aware of the concept, working for two weeks on a, a set of outcomes, and then we, you know, we review our progress and we move on to the next one. I want you to give one hour of your time per sprint to security. Now, that doesn't mean go and, you know, study to be a penetration tester or anything like that. It could just be that you go find a conference talk from security that's interesting to you, and you go watch that. It could be that you go and talk to your security team. It could be that you go and change those passwords that you know you've had a little bit too long. I'm not judging, we all have that. So one hour per sprint. And if all of us, there's about 30 million software developers in the world right now, if all of us did just one hour every two weeks, that would be a huge impact on security. So, so that's what I'm gonna challenge folks to do. And if you're not sure where to get started with those talks and videos, Go and look at things like Apollo Robbins' TED Talk from 2018, where he teaches you how to be a con artist and misdirect attention. Um, that's really interesting and very valid to security. Go play with ChatGPT and get, see if you can get it to create a malicious email or pretend to be a company or a person, because you'll start thinking about security while playing. So be creative, be fun, and just use one hour every sprint. Excellent. Challenge accepted. I'm going to block time out of my calendar right after this. And thank awesome. you for the recommendations and where to get started. Uh, so now that we have gotten to know you as a leader in technology, what are you passionate about outside of work? <laughs> um, I restore old things that are broken, um, sewing machines, um, old mechanical things. They were built to last forever, and often they've been just left to rot in cupboards and, you know, garages and things. So I restore those. I garden and grow things, and I have two beautiful daughters. So there's a lot of time at the moment making things out of Lego. There's an entire city currently in my living room. So, um, yeah, that's that's a lot of chaos and fun. Um, and in all honesty, I read really trashy novels about, you know, princesses who are saving the day and having to have magic powers and, you know, all of the type of stuff that you never admit in a book group or on the Internet because, you know, people would judge you. <laughs> that's great. Oh, thank you for sharing. Um, Laura, this has been a wonderful conversation today. Are there any final thoughts that you'd like to share and ways we can learn more? Absolutely. So firstly, don't be overwhelmed by security. You don't need to be an expert. You don't need to have had a degree in it. Security is a mindset thing and you already do it every day. So don't overthink it. Just get on with your one hour. The other thing is, if you want to get started and you're in the software space, uh, my company SafeStack has a free plan um, that you can just go on no strings, no credit card, no trick. And the idea is that wherever you are in the world, big or small, that you can go and do some of those essentials, those basics, and get yourself a grounding. And, you know, that can be a really powerful thing, not just for your organization you're working in and the tools you're building right now, but for the rest of your career. And if anyone wants to chat about security and nerd out, uh, they're welcome to reach out to me. Um, and I'm always happy to talk. Great. Thank you, Laura. Laura, thank you so much for joining me on the Women Who Code podcast today and sharing your knowledge. It has been wonderful talking with you and learning about your journey and experiences. And I know I'm leaving here today feeling 
inspired. Awesome. It was great fun. Thank you.